Welcome to part 3 of the video on the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Okay, right, so we've now talked about the synthesis and release of cortisol into the bloodstream by the cells of the zona fasciculata. We've then talked about the proteins that are in the blood uh, which will bind to cortisol and transport it around the bloodstream because remember it's still not particularly water soluble, it's still better for it to bind to a protein to be transported around the bloodstream than just being free in the bloodstream. Okay, now what we want to talk about is what is cortisol actually going to do? Now I'm going to split this up into two stages. The first stage I'm going to actually talk about the way that it changes the behaviour of cells. So I'm going to talk about the glucocorticoid receptor pathway. Then what I'm going to do is talk about what actual changes does it cause uh, to happen in different cells, in different tissues of the body. Uh, so, initially I'm just going to have a look at the pathway by which it affects the behaviour of cells and then we'll actually talk about, at specific locations around the body, what is the actual change in the behaviour of that cell that the cortisol induces. Okay, so initially the pathway is going to go for all the cells that cortisol is going to affect and it's just going to be the glucocorticoid receptor pathway and then we'll actually talk about, so what are the overall effects for the entire body. Okay, right. Uh, so. I'll just put the title glucocorticoid receptor pathway. So we are trying to understand how it is that cortisol is actually going to have an effect on cells. It's going to change the behaviour of cells, but how? How is it actually going to change the behaviour of cells? And it's going to work by binding to a receptor known as the glucocorticoid receptor, uh, which is then going to initiate a pathway to change the gene expression within cells and that's going to then lead to the change in the behaviour of the cells. So this is going to be the glucocorticoid receptor pathway and I'll just underline this in blue. Okay, so I'm just going to draw then an arbitrary cell and we're going to draw the pathway out uh, for this cell. So this box then, this can represent an arbitrary cell in your body. Okay, and we're also going to need to mark on this picture the nucleus of the cell. So let's say that this is going to represent the nucleus of the cell. So this is some cell here, and this is its nucleus here. Right, so what's going to happen first is that cortisol molecules are going to come into the cell, and as I say, they're still reasonably lipid soluble, even with all of these alcohol groups having been added onto them, uh, you know, added onto the steroid structure to create cortisol cortisol is still reasonably lipid soluble so it can get across the cell membrane of the cell just by passing through the cell membrane. Okay, and I'm just drawing it as this orange box here. So here's our cortisol now inside the cytoplasm of the cell. What's now going to happen is it's going to bind to the glucocorticoid receptor. Now the glucocorticoid receptor is usually in the cytoplasm and it's usually bound to a protein that is blocking it from entering the nucleus. Now, the glucocorticoid receptor is actually going to form a specific transcription factor, and I'll explain what's meant by specific transcription factor later on, but for now, just understand that it's something that changes gene expression within the cell. Now, in order to do that, it needs to be inside the nucleus, so keeping it in the cytoplasm prevents it from doing anything. So usually the glucocorticoid receptor, which is our GR here, so I'll colour the glucocorticoid receptor in, in pink, is kept in the cytoplasm because it's bound to a protein known as heat shock protein 90. It's actually bound to loads of other proteins as well, but just for simplicity we can uh, simplify it down to just being bound to heat shock protein 90. This is certainly the most famous protein that sequesters the glucocorticoid receptor in the cytoplasm. So HSP90 here stands for heat, that's the H, shock, that's the S, and then P for protein. Okay, so HSP90, heat, shock, protein 90. So this is a protein that is normally binding to glucocorticoid receptors, the GR proteins here, and keeping them in the cytoplasm. So when the glucocorticoid receptor is dimerized with a heat shock protein 90, it cannot go into the nucleus, it's kept in the cytoplasm, and therefore it's not doing anything. 
What's now going to happen then when, then when the cortisol arrives is the cortisol will bind to the glucocorticoid receptor and it causes the heat shock protein 90 to cleave away from the glucocorticoid receptor. So you form a complex of the cortisol with its glucocorticoid receptor and no longer do you have the heat shock protein 90. So this binds on and this cleaves off. So you end up with the glucocorticoid receptor with the cortisol bound to it. And I'll draw this in here. Clearly it will have to be a little bit smaller than previously. So that's meant to represent the glucocorticoid receptor in pink there. And here's now the cortisol bound to it. Okay. Um, and now that the glucocorticoid receptor no longer has the heat shock protein 90 bound to it, it can get into the nucleus. So it can go into the nucleus. The next step is for glucocorticoid receptors with cortisol molecules bound to them that are in the nucleus to dimerize, to form a homodimer like so. So you'll have two glucocorticoid receptors, both of them have a cortisol molecule bound to them, and they formed a homodimer. So I'll just colour this in. So these are my two glucocorticoid receptors in pink there, and here are their cortisol molecules bound to them. So they have formed, and I'll write this key word up here, they have formed a homodimer. A dimer is just a two-membered structure. A hom homo means the same, so it's just a two-membered structure made from two identical units. So you've got a glucocorticoid receptor homodimer here, and what's now going to happen is this glucocorticoid receptor homodimer is going to function as a transcription factor, specifically what is known as a specific transcription factor. And I just want to go over the basics of epigenetics to remind you of what is meant by a specific transcription factor. Okay, so let me remind you then of the basics of epigenetics. So in eukaryotic cells, upstream of all genes in the genome, you are going to have a region known as the gene control region. So I'll just draw this out. So let's say that these two parallel lines here are going to represent a stretch of DNA. And let's say that this portion of the DNA here, in pink, this is the gene. So here we have some gene, and of course you'll have loads of genes in the human genome. So um, take one of them, I think there's 30,000 genes or something along those lines in the human genome. So take one of them. Now, upstream of every single gene in the human genome, you have a region of the DNA that isn't part of the gene. It's not going to be um, transcribed and then translated into protein, but it's incredibly important nonetheless, and it's involved in controlling how much the gene is expressed. So this portion of DNA upstream of the gene, this is known as the gene control region for that gene. And the reason it's called that is it's going to control how much the gene is expressed. Now, what do I mean by how much the gene is expressed? I mean how much mRNA and how much protein do you actually produce for that gene? How much of the gene product for the gene do you actually produce? I should say that rather than protein, because not all genes are necessarily um, made into well, used to make protein, the final product could be the RNA rather than the protein. It's more often than not the case that the final product of the gene is a protein, but some genes have as their product just the RNA. So I should, strictly speaking, say the gene product of the gene. So, the gene control region controls how much of the gene product for the gene is actually going to be produced. Now, how does it do this? Well, one portion of the gene control region, the portion of the gene control region immediately upstream of the gene here, is known as the promoter region. So that box that I've got there, that can represent our promoter region. So one little portion of the gene control region, that is the portion immediately upstream of the gene, is known as the promoter region, or the promoter box, you can call it. And this is the place where um, the RNA polymerase 2 complex, which is actually going to transcribe the gene, is going to assemble. So the main way that you control how much a gene is expressed is by controlling how much transcription actually occurs for that gene. So the promoter region is the place where the RNA polymerase 2 is going to assemble, the enzyme which is going to transcribe the gene. So clearly, by controlling how often the um, RNA polymerase 2 assembles on here, we can control how much the gene is actually uh, expressed. So on the promoter region then, 
what first he has to bind is loads of proteins known as general transcription factors. So here's the difference between uh, specific transcription factors and general transcription factors. So general transcription factors are far rarer than specific transcription factors. There are a huge number of different proteins that are specific transcription factors. There are very few, I think it's about 30 general transcription factors that exist in humans. All the transcription factor is, is a protein which recognizes and binds to a specific sequence of organic bases. So that's all that's meant by a transcription factor, a protein with the capacity to bind to a specific sequence of DNA. Now, the general transcription factors, these are a set of proteins, a very small set of proteins, that are capable of binding to the promoter region upstream of any gene in the genome. So the promoter region is pretty much very similar in, uh, all, in the case of all the different genes. So you've got a huge number of different genes in the human genome. They've all got different gene control regions, but the promoter region, this portion of the gene control region that's immediately upstream of the gene, that's pretty conserved between different genes. It won't be identical, but it will be very similar. And the reason is that the same general transcription factors have to bind to that promoter region in order to get the RNA polymerase II um, assembling on top of it. So the basic set of events that has to happen is onto the promoter region, lots of these general transcription factors have to bind, and I'll just sort of represent that like so. So this box can represent the general transcription factors. And just to jog your memory of general transcription factors, an example, for instance, is transcription factor 2D that you might have heard of. Uh, that's an example of a general transcription factor. Uh, and it will bind to a specific sequence of DNA, namely the very famous tartar box, thymine, adenine, thymine, adenine. That's the sequence that it binds to, which will always be found in the promoter region upstream of any gene. So these general transcription factors bind on top of the promoter region, and then on top of the general transcription factors then assembles the RNA polymerase II enzyme, which is often abbreviated down to the RNAP2. So RNA, P for polymerase, and then 2 for 2. So on top of the general transcription factors, we'll then assemble the RNA polymerase 2. Okay, and then of course, once it's assembled, it will then work its way along the gene and produce a piece of mRNA from that gene, i.e. transcription will occur. Right, so that's the bit that occurs upstream of any gene just the same. The bit that's more interesting and the bit that's relevant to us is now about specific transcription factors and what the rest of the gene control region does. So the rest of the gene control region determines how often the general transcription factors and the RNA polymerase II actually bind on top of the promoter region and therefore it controls how often the gene is going to be transcribed and therefore it controls gene expression. So the promoter region, that's just the portion that's actually involved in assembling the RNA polymerase II on top of it so that transcription can occur. The portion of the gene control region upstream of the promoter region is then involved in controlling how often that actually occurs and therefore really controls the expression of the gene. Okay, so all genes therefore have this gene control region which is controlling how often they are actually going to be transcribed and therefore their expression level. Now, what can happen is the gene control region upstream of different genes, and I'm talking now about the portion of the gene control region beyond the promoter region, this portion here, this will contain loads of different sequences depending on which gene you're looking at. So if you go to all the different genes in the genome, they'll all have different gene control regions upstream of the promoter region. So this portion is very conserved, this portion is not. And these gene control regions, they will have sequences that can then bind to other proteins, other transcription factors, which are now the specific transcription factors. And the specific transcription factors, when they bind to these sequences, will change the probability that the RNA polymerase II is going to assemble on the promoter region, and therefore change the expression of the downstream gene. So, coming back then to the glucocorticoid receptor homodimer that we've got here, this is now a specific transcription factor, and 
it will have a specific sequence of DNA that it's capable of binding to. And that specific sequence of DNA, I don't actually know what the organic base sequence is, but it has a name. This sequence is known as the glucocorticoid response element. Okay, so GRE, and I'll write it out in full up here. So GRE, and I'll just make sure this is in sight. Yes, it is. This stands for the glucocorticoid response element, which is a reasonable name to call it. Um, so the glucocorticoid response element means this sequence of organic bases, and it will be a short sequence of organic bases, no more than 10 organic bases, I would imagine, that the glucocorticoid receptor homodimer recognizes and is capable of binding to. And this specific sequence, the glucocorticoid response element, will be found in certain gene control regions for certain genes. If you were to go through all the genes in the human genome, a bunch of them in their gene control region portion upstream of the promoter region would have the glucocorticoid response element in it. So let's say this one happens to have this. So up here, let's say that we have a little sequence of organic bases, which happens to be the glucocorticoid response element here. Then what can happen is to all these genes that do have the glucocorticoid response element in their gene control regions, the glucocorticoid receptor homodimer, once it's formed, will bind there, and then it will change the probability that the RNA polymerase 2 will bind to the promoter region upstream of that gene, and therefore change the expression of that gene. Now, how can it actually change the probability that the RNA polymerase 2 will bind here? Well, there are two major mechanisms. One, it can directly interact with the assembling complex and either activate it or inhibit it. Two, it can lead to chromatin changes. So remember, DNA is wrapped around histone proteins. And it can either be wrapped around histone proteins extremely tightly, or it can be much more loosely wrapped around histone proteins. Now, if the DNA is wrapped around histone proteins very tightly, it's very difficult for the RNA polymerase 2 to assemble on top of the promoter regions in that portion of DNA. Whereas if it's wrapped much more loosely around the histone proteins, and then it's much more easy for uh, the RNA polymerase 2 to assemble on top of promoter regions in that DNA, and therefore transcription will be much higher. So the major way then that specific transcription factors can change the likelihood that their downstream gene will be transcribed is by either directly interacting with the assembling RNA polymerase 2 complex, or by changing the structure of the chromatin, either making it wrap around the DNA, sorry, wrap around the histones more tightly, or making the DNA wrap around the histones less tightly. Okay, so, the important thing to understand is that this glucocorticoid receptor homodimer here will not affect all genes in the same way. I, it's not necessary that it will bind to the glucocorticoid response element in all of the gene control regions that it's present. Um, and will affect the downstream genes of those gene control regions in exactly the same way, i.e. it will promote all of their expressions. It can have a mixed effect. In some it might promote their expression, in others it might change, it might reduce their expression. So overall, this is the message then. We form these glucocorticoid receptor homodimers in the nucleus of cells where cortisol is present. And these are going to change gene expression within that cell. Some genes will have their expression increased, other genes will have their expression decreased. A lot of genes, most genes, will have their expression completely unchanged by the glucocorticoid receptor homodimer. But overall, that is the way in which the cortisol is going to produce a change in the behavior of these cells by changing their gene expression. So cortisol goes into cells, changes the gene expression within those cells, and that's how it actually has an effect within the cells, changing their behavior. Okay, so as I say, now what we'll do is we'll move on to discussing for different cells around the body, what is the actual change in behaviour that cortisol induces? We've discussed how it induces a change in behaviour in different cells. Oh, and by the way, it's important to note that in different cell types as well, you will get 
different changes in gene expression occurring because different cell types uh, have very different epigenetic profiles. They have very different starting levels of gene expression for the different genes. So, for instance, red blood cells, they have hemoglobin, whereas no other cell in the body you produces the proteins that are needed to produce hemoglobin. Okay? So, different cell types around the body have different uh, expressions of the different genes of the genome, and when you have a hormone like this that produces a change in behaviour by changing the expression level of genes, it's going to affect different cells and different, different cell types in different ways. Uh, so what we want to now see is what are the actual effects in different cell types around the body, major cell types around the body. And as I say, we're going to look at the two major effects of cortisol, which are its effects on metabolism and its effects on the immune system. And we'll begin by looking at the effects on metabolism in the next video.